<laughs> Welcome, everybody, to our newest episode of Roll of a Tangent, where we blooper our way through this very scary special. Yes. Uh, so, Halloween is right round the corner, dear readers. So, how can we not avail ourselves to sampling our first short story from the Ravenloft campaign setting by Drag- Dungeons and Dragons? Following our colourful discussions on the Dragons of Autumn Twilight, which no doubt the, uh, some members of the podcast have blotted out from their memory. <laughs> we'll be making yet another foray into the world. Now, now you've made me scared. Like before, <laughs> there was just nothing. But now, now I'm afraid. <laughs> we'll be making yet another foray into a world and system developed by Tracy and Laura Hickman in 1983. Dark Trist is a short story written by Andrea Heyde under the pseudonym Andrea Carderell in Tales of Ravenloft, a short story collection published in 1994. Ravenloft is a gothic horror setting follow- following the uh, literary aesthetics set by the Castle of Otranto, written in 1764 by Horace Walpole, regarded as perhaps the very first gothic work and further carried through the centuries by giants such as Mary Shelley and, of course, Bram Stoker. Here, we will find very familiar elements of werewolves, vampires, and other monsters from popular culture. In addition to this, readers and tabletop RPG players alike are liable to bump into villains from the various different campaign settings in Wizards of the Coast's extensive library of rights. This is due to the mechanics of the Ravenloft setting, the details of which I shall leave to my co-host, Nikki. Uh, But in brief, Ravenloft is set in a pocket dimension or demiplane in which uh, D&D is an alternate time-space existence. That's a lot of geeky, nerdy D&D talk, but what it boils down to is that the the demiplane is a patchwork of domains, and each of these domains are ruled by a dark lord. The domain is magically twisted to reflect the nature of the dark lord by a mysterious force known only as the dark powers. Dark lords are drawn from their native plane of existence by the dark powers, and granted domains and powers and forever imprisoned in those domains, unable to cross boundaries and venture beyond their territory. So, in other words, this is a little bit like a Disney theme park. Strat von Zarovic is the first Dark Lord to come to Rivenloft, but other familiar figures from other campaigns also have domains in the demiplane of Dread, such as Lord Soth, the Death Knight from the world of Kryn. The Patchwork nature of Ravenloft allows for a very free hand in storytelling and Dark Trist is a tale of seduction and temptation, very much in the flavour of Anne Rice. Our protagonist is Mariel, one of the Vistani. The Vistani are a um, cartoon stereotype of the nomadic Romani of uh, Europe. It is perhaps not the most respectful way to portray a people, but the campaign is a product of its time. Mariel is kin to the caravan's seer Magda, who have some powers of ma- of the magical nature, common to the stereotype again of a fortune teller. Ma- Mariel herself has some of that sorcery flowing in her veins, and she, like Magda, is viewed with super superstitious fear by the rest of the caravan. Only the threat of a curse by Magda kept civility within the camp but Magda had died before our story begins. The night when the narrative opens, Maria was struck by a vision of a man's hand grasping her ankle. Later that night, she focused on the vision and summoned a being by the name of Damius. Damius and Maria met repeatedly over the next few days, and eventually Damius brought Maria to his tribe, tempting her to join his people. He claims, however, that his tribe is cursed with the inability to have children, and for her to join his tribe, Mariel must prick the finger of a newborn and deliver a tiny sample of the blood to Damius. Mariel does so, prickling the finger of Annalise's baby, the only person in Mariel's caravan to have shown her any warmth and friendliness. 
The child was turned into a shriveled, blackened mass as a result, and Maria was stoned to death by the caravan for her actions. She seemingly died, but rose later to join Damius with his child in her womb. All right, let's uh, turn to uh, turn the. Let me pass the feather in my cap to my co-host, uh, and perhaps we shall start with Robert. Tell us what you think of um, this short story. It's a bit of a risk to start with me because I haven't really shown up very well as a reader of this story. For one thing, I it was news to me that Maria actually was stoned to death. I know she was stoned, but I wasn't sure that she'd died. Perhaps I hadn't read Neither, it. neither was I, to be honest. Um, hmm. I'll That's how I interpreted I, it anyway. Right. Well, let me let me say what I think the meaning of the story is. I'm sort of about 58.7% sure that this is the right interpretation. That is such <laughs> a precise number. <laughs> that, well, I'm only saying roughly speaking. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the child which got pricked and which supposedly died reappears and i thought that that's a way in which this other tribe recruits members mm. they, they somehow have to go through a certain transformation which to normal people like us would look like death and mm. you can call it that if you like but in fact it's a sort of uh, reincarnation almost or contemporary reincarnation in other words, it's a, it's a bit like the metempsychosis in Poe's Ligia, that you, you stop being somebody and you start being somebody else. Well, it's not quite the same, actually, so perhaps forget what I've just said. But anyway, um, that's that's what I that's what I understood, and uh, I thought maybe it's just a teeny bit risky to write a story, which the meaning of which is so hard to be sure of. But perhaps perhaps I'm wrong, and perhaps that's what makes it good. I'm not sure. Anyway, I will hurriedly pass on the comments, the, the floor, rather, to uh, Nikki. Okay, so first of all, before I talk about the story itself, let me give you a little bit more... Uh, information on well Ravenloft the the setting in which this is happening so this is a very similar situation that we had with two kinds of fool and um test of the twins yeah test of the twins so this is a this is a story that's happening in a setting and there's multiple writers who are um, participating. I know Ravenloft from D Dungeons and Dragons. So I did not have a work of fiction to read, to be introduced to Ravenloft. I, f I was in Ravenloft during a game of Dungeons and Dragons. And the way that, uh, that transpired to me was, you know, we all got together and we, we had this dungeon master who took the 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 story of Ravenloft, and uh, we did it uh, in Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, so that that's like basically the second iteration of the game, uh, third if you count uh, the basic rules. And what he did was usually a Ravenloft campaign would be spread out through an amount of weeks. You know, like you'd play four four hours every week on a particular day. And you'd get to the end. But he he had ran Ravenloft so many times that he has mastered the way to run it all in one night. To get the the to make this roller coaster experience. And the story of Ravenloft, the very first book that was uh, made, uh, was about a Dracula-esque character, Strad von Zarovich. And the story um Starts with you being somewhere else in some other place in your hometown of your fantasy characters, 
and somebody arrives and gives you an invitation to a castle nearby. And you start to try and follow and find this castle, and mists roll in, you fall asleep, and you wake up in a domain of dread, Barovia, where Strad von Zarevich is the ruler, and he is the most powerful puppeteer one could imagine. Um, there are these um, natives to, to the land who, although are in a grim situation, they try their best to still revel in their existence. Um, sort of like the vampire uh, Vistani that we saw, um, you know, do their, do their thing. But in the original g uh, game, all Vistani kind of acted like that. There weren't these, oh, life is hard and everything's so horrible, like Sergio's tribe, right? Like, they were all like, yeah, let's go, let's have some fun, because tomorrow a vampire will kill us, <laughs> you know? So, um, there's this there's this dissonance between me and this story. Like, this is the reason why I'm telling you this, you know, uh, step by step, because I have a very different idea of what my Ravenloft looks like. And this was what happens when, uh, you know, you play a game of Dungeons and Dragons. Every single table that you sit down at is going to be unique. It's going to have a very different way of interpreting things. Um, and the way I remember Ravenloft is the gauntlet going through the castle, fighting the magical armors that come to life. Um, horrible skeletons that emerged from the subwaters of the garden that tried to pull us down. Uh, the magical um, rooms, which whenever we entered, it, it looked like the, the room that we just uh, exited. And, you know, like that puzzle took us hours to, to figure out. Um, or what seemed like hours, at least. And then the last fight, the final fight against Strad von Zarevich and his, uh, you know, horrible uh, magics. That's Ravenloft for me. This story is, is like if someone took the experience of, of what I really liked about Raven, uh, Ravenloft. And they were like, but now we're going to cater it to a different demographic. Let's say, for example, they took someone like my sister. My sister is the opposite of me. She likes cuddly things. She, she is uh, fond of romantic stories. Uh, she likes, um, similar to me, she does like s some horror elements, but not too much. It can't, be, it can't go over. You know, like it, it has to be all implied. So they took that. And then they made Ravenloft for my sister. That's the way I feel about Dark Trist. It's like, it's so toned down to what I think of when I imagine Ravenloft. But if I were to put aside the story of Ravenloft and just look at this as a piece of writing... I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think it was fun. Uh, it was interesting. It was interesting to follow uh, this girl uh, who was, you know, um, having a terrible time uh, living amongst these uh, Vistani who really didn't get her and didn't want to get her. Uh, in fact, they hated her, right? And that struggle, that desire to find out. Guile of Sphere. It's this, the exact same reason why I like that story. You know, a young mind desiring to break free, to find out, to learn. It's a timeless idea. And here I think it's executed quite well in the 24, 25 pages that are, or 26 pages that are laid out in front of us. I would say, as far as capturing Ravenloft, uh, it's, it's, I mean, I guess there, there's some of it, a little bit of it, you know. Um, it doesn't feel very D&D &D to me. It doesn't feel very uh, Ravenloft to me. Maybe that's a good thing, you know. Maybe not every story has to have all those elements and really has to hammer home um, everything about the setting. It was a nice little piece of writing to, to enjoy on a autumn afternoon. Yeah, there you go. That would be my most of my thoughts anyways. What about you, actually? What did you think of Dark Trist? 
Um, so my uh, my experience to Raven Love is like the complete opposite of you yours, Mickey, because I didn't play the campaign. Uh, my first introduction to Raven Love is actually the very first book in the in the uh, Raven Love uh, library. I think it is the Golden Vampire. Mm-hmm. Which is a story about a uh, an elf that got turned into a vampire, and then got caught in and sent to uh, Strat's uh, domain. And it was a it was a story about uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, horror elements in 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 that particular story either. It was largely about the. Um, the uh the uh moral struggle the elf had with becoming a vampire so so um it was a uh it, it was a uh uh so the i mean i've read through what the campaign setting is like and i'm thinking to myself when i read through the campaign it's like this is this doesn't sound like a fun campaign man it's like it's like you are level 5 you know, and then you have to deal with, uh, uh, like, the most, for those that are in the know, uh, for those that are not in the know, the most annoying uh, thing to deal with in the D&D is energy drain. <laughs> it is the most annoying thing to deal with. And you're dealing with, uh, an you know, entire campaign is full of vampires and specters and raves and whites and is just energy drink law it's like oh my god i don't ever want to play this stupid thing uh so energy drain for those who don't know is is imagine you are progressing through something you're becoming better at driving you are becoming a better cook a better author energy drain takes away experience from you it takes away your mastery over the things you have learned over the past I don't know, two years of your life, let's say. That's what Energy Drain does. And it does it mechanically, too, within the game, right? Uh, but just the concept itself, you can kind of start realizing how horrible that might be and how annoying it will be. Uh, please go on, next. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, I, I wouldn't want to play... Uh, honestly, I don't want to play a campaign of Rivenloft. It's just... It's, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't sound... Like I was reading through the campaign setting because after the Golden Vampire, I was quite uh, 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 interested because the the idea itself was was very captivating. And then I looked at the campaign setting, and I'm like, it doesn't sound fun. It just sounds tedious. Well, that's just my opinion anyway. Um, but uh, going back to Dark Trist. Uh, so this is a short story from the from the Tales of Rivenloft collection, and it is, I feel, the best short story, technically speaking, uh, it, with the way it's written, like the prose and stuff, but also the 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 story itself is the best story that doesn't require. Um, anyone to have an understanding of the of the campaign setting itself um, mm. you don't have to it's a very it's a it barely talks about the mechanics of uh, Rivenloft there is no crossing of boundaries there is no dark lord uh, well we don't really know because a lot of things are not made clear like we don't know like uh going back to Rob's point, we don't know what kind of people da- Damius and his tribe are. Uh, and I certainly can't map that to any D&D monster at all. Uh, unless Nikki has uh, some insights. I thought about this for a while. I, I have some ideas. Okay. Share that later. Uh, can't wait to hear. Because I, I can't map what uh, Damius's tribe is. I cannot... Uh, I don't get the sense of who, which domain they are in. Uh, there is barely any talk of uh, D and D mechanics, like um, um, Nikki said. 
And I thought that Ductress as a as an introduction to the flavor of Riven Love stories, not the campaign, the stories, is pretty good because uh the 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 thing that characterizes Riven Love to me is the endings are always tragic. All the stories I've read about Raven Law have tragic endings. The Golden Vampire didn't have a happy ending. I can't remember, uh, but there was another book that I read about a witch whose whose dance will turn anyone that watches the dance into a zombie, and her lover watched her dance, and he got turned into a zombie at the end. And I, every single story I've read from Raven Law had that feeling and i thought dark Trist, uh exemplifies that without requiring you to know who lord soft is who strat von zarovich is who gender sunstar is and all that nonsense and just the story itself is is i think a lot of Implied is written in a way that I thought was very interesting. It was there's a lot of implied stuff. The the seduction of Marielle is very much implied. Uh, it's not overt. Um, a lot of other things are implied, like uh, um, uh, the we 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 don't really get a sense of of like I said before where her 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 Vistani camp really is. Uh, and uh, of course, we don't know who or what Damius is, but yeah, Nikki, tell us what do you think uh, Damius and his people are. Okay, so there's there's several compendiums of um, monsters for Ravenloft. What are compendiums of monsters? Robert Per is probably asking. Well, Dungeons and Dragons. Is all about fantasy adventure within a medieval setting, and a lot of the t a lot of time is spent uh, in the book describing how to do combat. So people usually focus on combat uh, as part of their games. Me, I'm a little bit different. I enjoy I enjoy story um, and you know uh, and more of a dramatic. Uh, type of sense you know i had that kind of flair to it but combat is very important still and in order to spice things up right you need new monsters and what uh dnd does is they they release these books with different types of monsters and there's plenty about ravenloft excuse me wow that was a big sneeze all right so i've looked through a lot of them so Somebody's my talking be about you behind your back that's what it is that's right is that is that like a <laughs> no that there's like a manga thing <laughs> it's a manga thing okay I see, I see. um yeah well i hope they're saying good things uh so there there's several things that i thought that this could be so my the most obvious answer is, is they are a vamp they are vampires uh they are energy vampires found in ravenloft uh because they can't have children um, because they uh, don't really seem to be anywhere near the sun anytime, any, uh, you know, at any point. And this, this whole thing of never being tired and constantly having all this, uh, energy, you know, it's just, it's screaming undead. Um, but I was like, okay, but that's an easy answer. So what else could it be? So one of the other things that I thought it could be, but I don't think so. Is uh, there is a there is a creature called a Darkling, which is a Vistani people that have been uh, exiled by by their uh, betters, and they sort of slowly become more evil and corrupted by the energies. But their skin becomes darker, not uh, paler. So there's you know like that doesn't fit. Uh, they could be whites. Uh, which are a type of undead which still um, have the remnants of um, um, of their knowledge of what they were in um, in life, 
but they are very limited in that. They're, they're kind of stuck in the type of thing that they exist. They kind of exist in a loop, right? Let's say that there was a warrior that died. The last thing he remembers, uh, maybe the best thing that he remembers about his life is fighting. So you, whenever you'll find him, he will be remembering and trying to fight people uh, as much as possible. So it could be the idea that, you know, this this woman that died, all she wanted was to have children, right? And that's why she's so focused on it. Uh, this um, uh, Damius died while looking for a wife, and that's why he's, you know, trying to find this girl, uh, and so on and so forth, right? But I think that's a bit of a stretch. Um, and the last thing that uh, these guys could be... Um, is um oh god let me let me look at my look look at my notes and s so i can say this word correctly air murder <laughs> air murdering. the murdering are a dark and evil people found almost exclusively in this domain here they act as elite agents who serve uh strad von Zarevich, ruler of the dread domain Enmurung uh, appearing as normal human beings or surpassing beauty. The men tall, normally no less than six feet in height and smoothly muscled. They seem to radiate an inner power from their finely set classical features. The women are tall, often only an inch or two shorter than the men and have the perfect features that every artist tries to create. I mean, it, the description alone sounds like... The people that uh, you know, our our lady met. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. I think there was something else that really looked like uh, that would connect them. Yeah, both sexes are marked by raven hair and uh, penetrating dark eyes that it is said are almost hypnotic. The complexion, however is a rather more pale than the common to most of the people. And the contrasts are greatly uh, with their dark hair and eyes. So... That pretty much just sounds like a vampire spawn. Correct, but Edramorong are people. They're people who uh, sort of use witchcraft and powers of, um, of dark magics in order to confuse and uh, entrap their prey hypnotically. So this describes the behavior of the tribe that we saw in the, um, in the story pretty well. Um, I would say still, though, that this is most likely just vampire, uh, uh, you know, vampire gypsies, because um, the author went on to write an entire novel about a girl falling in love with a vampire so this like it seems like maybe a prototype for that maybe right? i mean it like i said in my introduction it does remind me a lot about um there are a lot of elements in it in uh, that reminded me about the it uh, about interview with a vampire there is there is a, a lot of that uh, theme of uh, uh sexual tension and uh uh seduction and temptation uh yeah, I, I, I thought I thought the story itself is is again pretty well written. It is um it is a fairly interesting read. It 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 does open itself up to a lot of uh, interpretation like like uh like uh Robert said. Um it's like it's like I, I thought Marielle died. Uh because she ha she she then had the black hands or something like that, right? Uh, and then now, now the two of you cast doubts in my mind as to whether she actually died from the stoning. Mm. Yeah. She might have. She yeah, might have. I'm not saying she isn't, but it just seems like they threw some stuff at her and she just fell unconscious. Like, it doesn't seem to me like she's dead. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, like that, that uh, 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 I think one of the characteristics uh of uh, well one of the the thing about this story is is how a lot of the it's like again like a lot of the things are implied like uh that was clearly a very intimate scene between damius and mario but it wasn't ever really 
uh, described fully. You know, like uh, well, fully is not necessary, but it, 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 in very clear terms, it it's like we don't. It was not described in clear terms. Which is uh, mm. just uh, shortly after she pricked the finger of Annalisa's baby, she and Damius had like a little time in the forest. <laughs> and that particular section was um, was uh, described with uh, just a touch, you know. And I, I, I like that uh, that uh, writing style it 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 paints enough of a picture for your mind to interpret it uh but you you don't go in and actually tell it and for a short story i think that is that works and for a short story of this nature which well the uh, sexual tension is actually where the sexual tension is actually pretty high you might want to get past the <laughs> uh, the uh, the uh, ratings board, yeah. I suppose that, uh, in a way, I was missing the point. If 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 the question is, did Maria die or not? I one's got to realize that the whole point of vampire fiction is that the distinction between life and death gets blurred uh, it's, it can be dead in one sense and not in another and maybe this story is a an extrapolation of that theme you know the very interesting thing about vampires uh, not just in Didi but in, in, in popular culture and in all the stories that are written since uh, Dracula is that even though they're they're dead. They are very. They are filled with fiery passion, if you think about it. They they are filled with lust. They are filled with um, anger, with hatred, with mm. with things that we don't associate with uh, uh, zombies and ghouls, for instance, or even specters, um, raves or or ghosts. They're they're like uh, completely. They're almost. They're. It's like you said. They are not that different from humans, mm. and I think perhaps that's why vampires are such a, such a fascinating. Uh, 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 thing. I I yeah, like the words a thing to 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 explore for a lot of people, yeah. Mm. But you, it's very, it's the in a literary sense, it's fraught with danger in that it's any any kind of um, overdoing it with a vampire story is will kill the story stone dead. It's like uh, it's like humor in a way if you. If you make an attempt at humor and it fails, it's better not to have tried. Uh, it can, you know, if it falls flat, that that's the end. And and vampires, you can uh, you can overdo the the sharp teeth and all that, and it just becomes a, a parody of itself very easily. That's true. I I would also say that the the one problem with vampires is that. You, it's very hard to escape the uh, seduction part of it. Uh, I think in my memory, the maybe the only uh, vampire story that wasn't focused on a predator and a prey a relationship that is almost sexual in nature is uh, maybe the golden vampire. Because that was the, the focus of that was different. It was a moral struggle within um, gender sun star, and uh, uh, it it I I I I I don't know. Since Bram Stoker, I don't think any vampire story had been able to escape that particular bent. Even Asylum had a lot of that uh, that energy of uh, of of just like being really 
on on a line like treading a thin line between uh, intimacy and something else. Mm. Yeah, well, the uh, the emotions kind of get dead in in the science fictional version of Asylum. In a, it, some of the emotions get dead, although there are sort of bleak remnants of human emotion. But in uh, Dracula, I think it's or is it some other vampire story? It's stated that vampires don't have the power of combination, which is just as well for the rest of us. That is to say, they're all selfish, even in their own terms. Of course, some of them were like that in life anyway, but even if you happen to be uh, a good person who's re recruited by misfortune into their ranks, presumably you lose the power of association with your your fellows and you become totally selfish i think that's quite an, an eerie concept and a, a good one as well i think I uh is here though. yeah i think uh, uh vampires are just like a just like a mirror that we look into and perhaps see like uh darker more dangerous versions of ourselves and maybe that is why they are so seductive yeah. I don't know I think it's more a case of uh, uh, creepy supernaturalism than, than you're really allowing for mm. yes I really do well um, I'm a munchkin when it comes to games so vampires are really just uh, a piece of experience points that is a little bit more difficult to get to than most others <laughs> Yeah, sort of. Uh, you've kind of tamed it in that sense, haven't you? You've removed the. You've re removed the um, the real shuddersomeness from it by by looking at that. And that's what I was saying before that it's very hard to avoid the danger of overdoing hmm. overdoing things with that theme. I I've always felt maybe this is just me, but. Vampires have way too many rules for them to follow. And they're too convoluted. So, like, they can't go go uh, through an area if there's, like, running water passing by. Mm. They can't get into your house unless you invite them. They can't stay in the, in the day because the, the sun will hurt them. Uh, they're afraid of crosses. <laughs> the smell of garlic makes them repulsed. No, um, well, they can't stand roses. Roses? Hmm. But it's not garlic. Garlic as well, certainly, but they, they don't like roses either. They don't like roses! Oh mm. my god, they sound like, they, from super formidable foes, they, they sound like a really weak vegetarian person. <laughs> you know, like, it's, it's just, uh, we just don't like this. You know, I could take a rose and throw it at a vampire, it's like, ah! You know, like, <laughs> okay, so you see what I mean? That it just to me, it feels like for them to be so formidable, you got to remove some of these. Sort of I things. I wonder, I wonder how many of that is tacked on later because I'm trying to remember what uh, what was in the in the very first uh, vampire book, I guess, uh, which is Dracula. Uh, I think. But uh, what a cool name, Dracula! Anyway. Yeah. So, well. I can only remember a, something about the being invited into a room and being afraid of uh, mm. the Lord. But then everything is everything dark is afraid of the Lord. So, you know, uh, that's yeah. a given. So I would. Sorry? Um, I just thought of something. I know um, a piece of fiction that isn't about the seductiveness of the vampire. That's kind of famous. Uh, the Castlevania. All, oh. both the Castlevania series and That's the Castlevania true. TV show, they're more, they're about different things. They're not That's about true. Like a vampire. That's very Listen. true. Uh, I just remembered another, another, another piece of work that is uh, not about the, 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 the seduction of uh, that 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 doesn't have that seduction team, and that is Count Dracula. <laughs> <laughs> I love that show when I was a kid. What, what is you. Count Dracula? Tell oh, us. So, 
so Count Dracula is a Disney fight uh, <laughs> vampire story. It's a it's a cartoon series, and um, our titular count. Uh, wants to become a he is a staunch vegetarian, so he drinks tomato juice, and not blood, and his uh butler that uh is always trying to get him to <laughs> go back to his roots, and regain his power is is actually quite funny. I I I loved that show when I was a kid. <laughs> well, <laughs> sounds delightful. I would recommend you watch uh, Castlevania, Robert. But actually, I think it's. Let me put it this way. Um, we have our disagreements um, regarding many different topics. But one of the things that I do agree with you is that sometimes in modern literature or modern works, there's just some excessive swearing that doesn't need to be there. Castlevania, the, the four seasons uh, on Netflix, it, it got, like I have no idea why sometimes those characters swear. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. It's just, like, matter of fact where it it, it gets lost. Like, I think, um, t to get completely off topic, I think that swearing is a very powerful tool that you can use in writing. But if you do do it, it has to be, like, once, right? So it, just to express how horrible something is, right? You have someone say, as they're, they're seeing the thing come up, they, they say, like, shit, you know, like, as it, as it comes over towards them. Yeah, that makes sense. But, like, when it's every fifth word, then... You know, it loses all meaning. It's just, you know, it's just crass. And it happens in that Castlevania TV show. Every time, like, I was sitting there watching and I was like, oh, no, I'm becoming Robert. Like, this this is bad. I don't, li I don't, I don't like them swearing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> do, you, do you feel proud that you're having an effect on me, Robert? <laughs> yeah, I've been waiting for this for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the prodigal son has returned um but i I'm still would yeah yeah Sorry, what were you I gonna say, say um i should have said this earlier it's slightly off what you were saying but i didn't know all this business of uh uh it, the link to dungeons and dragons i just didn't know about it when i was reading the story and hmm. i think i'm quite glad that i didn't know actually because uh I was able just to think of it as a story. Um, yeah, I mean that was uh, that is uh, pretty much the entire reason why I picked uh, Doctress out of the short story collection because everything else you kind of have to know a little bit about the uh, the uh, backstory of the campaign setting, and I think the reason for this is 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 in part the way these short stories are written because they are written as a supplement for uh, the main stories that came before like the test of the twins is like a filler for for um, uh, the the dragons of autumn twilight the dragons of winter night and the dragons of uh, spring dawning series to fill in the blanks about the twins you know and so so every other story was like you had to know what what some of the the stuff about the uh D &D, the D, D setting is and i thought that would make it it might be interesting for the for aficionado. the an mm. aficionado of the of of D, D, but it just won't make sense to to anyone else mm. yeah mind you i i I ought to th sympathize with lots of stories set in a common background because my uh, area of expertise is the old solar system. I've, I manage uh, an enormous website about, all about that, about stories set in the uh, solar system as we used to imagine it before space probes uh, spoiled it all for us. Um, hmm. And uh, they, it's not formally speaking a common background but it just happens that the ideas have evolved to agree with each other to to quite a large extent there's lots of overlaps um, but they any good story is is readable on its own i agree i mean the last church is a great example of that neither of you knew the characterizations of the emperor nor of his struggle but you were able to understand it all 
for just reading the story, right? Just I, getting to see it. I know enough to know that the guy talking to the priest is the um, the god emperor himself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's not the disputable, right? Like he reveals it in the story. Yeah. I mean, before he revealed it, it was ah, pretty mean, clear, actually, pretty actually. clear who he was. Mm. Yeah. 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 Anyway, uh, yeah. Right. Um. So, on on topic of um works that were created for um a, a setting, right? I presume that this it was like this, right? Ravenloft is quite popular. Hey, authors, could you write a story in Ravenloft? And a bunch of people probably took aspects or ideas that they enjoyed about Ravenloft. That took a monster from Raven. I didn't read the 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 whole book. I just read the story, so I couldn't tell. Um, but it's it's probably hard. It's it's very hard even to just be told, right, here you go. You have not only do you have to write a story that has a genre pre, uh, preordained to it, you also have to stick to these guidelines and it has to be exactly like the the world that you're working on currently. You know, it's a tall mm. order to, to produce something both engaging for the reader and also um, something that represents the world that you're creating uh, this fiction in. Yeah. It's hard enough when one's created the world of oneself. Uh, <laughs> the bigger the, it gets, the, the the more you have to look to check for inconsistencies. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I have PDFs checking for inconsistencies. Mm. Yeah, and and yeah, I I I think uh, I think Doctor's manages uh, very well in that regard because it it didn't get bogged down in details, and that's the really important thing. We, at the end of the day, who cares exactly what Damius and his people are, right? The the, the important well, okay, uh, <laughs> you're excommunicated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not the first time but I get yeah. I get dissolved from something. Go on. Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, th- like just exactly who Damius, uh, what Damius and his people are, didn't get in the way of the story. Uh, exactly where the Vistanis are in this story. Uh, didn't get in the way of the storytelling and all of that nonsense about the dark powers which I think is pretty dumb to be quite honest um, and uh, and uh, what, what do you think is pretty dumb sorry the the concept of the dark powers you mean the domains of dread the, um, the, the, let the me powerful... let me let me yeah. let me rephrase that if you if you only if you only go into one, uh, campaign setting uh it's actually of ribbon love is actually pretty it's actually pretty cool like you can really craft like a really nice gothic horror story around the concept but when you zoom out take a really wide view of ribbon love itself it is like i said a theme park you do you know that there are like 16 other theme parks next to Barovia, by the way. Do you, I, do you know do you know about the domains of dread? Yeah, I mean like like I said, I I I I the it's like a patchwork. It's like they're all sitting right next to each other. They can't cross into the borders. They they're literally like you know, come come take a come take a caravan ride which the Vistanis can do but nobody else in uh, Ravenloft can by the way. Uh, you take a train ride into this realm and then you go to a, uh, another realm. There's one of the short stories had like a powerful necromancer whose realm borders that of Strad. And I think uh, I think there's an uh, and of course Lot Sof has his own domain. So yes, like that that it is a patchwork. So the, so go ahead. So to explain to those who don't understand what the hell we're talking about, so um, Baro- so it started all as right Barovia, little plane, you just go in there, done and gone. Um, as editions of D and D went on, other authors began to tweak uh, Ravenloft a little bit, and some of them realized, well, why don't we make more mini planes like this, and we'll just all theme them again uh, with with them being horrific and dark and horrible. So there is Haslan, the domain of Haslicks, weird creatures. 
Um, there is uh, Blue Spur, a domain uh, that is dominated by Mind Flayers, a giant octopus people, right? And so on and so forth. Uh, and they're all just like stuck, just like uh, XG has described in this little puzzle, puzzle pieces. They can't really like cross from one another, but sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. And it's all very complicated. And it basically boils down to don't ask us. We spend way too much time trying to make it make sense. <laughs> And it doesn't, so stop asking. Yeah, so which is why I think like the when if the very first um, the very first uh, it worked in the first it, it probably worked the first time round, you know, with Lord Strad, uh, von Zarovich, mm. but then it just became a bit of a mockery of itself over time when more and more got added into it, you know, it's like. It, it 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 yeah that's why i think like the uh, the concept of the dark powers is just like a bit well i'm not i'm not entirely uh ex thrilled over it so but um disregarding all that dark Tris itself is a is a is a good read and uh uh i think it manages to capture the uh feeling of Ravenloft pretty well. Wait, the short story about the necromancer is it about is it about Haslick? Is it about the um, the red wizard? I I can't remember the name. Uh, all I remember is he ca it, 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 uh, the story was about a peddler trying to to get his um, son back which had been kidnapped by the Vistani which is again another <laughs> awful stereotype uh, uh, children stealing you know and uh, and the necromancer summons zombies that's all I remember I don't remember the name okay. yeah. ah well yeah you said necromancer not um, not just uh, wizard my bad no. um, yeah look if you're gonna consume Ravenloft, just stick with Barovia. Anytime you go anywhere else, there's just too many questions. Just too many, too many questions that they will never answer because they've made a real big mess of it. So the only way they can really answer it is by revisiting and restructuring the idea completely. Well, you know, I guess that's a that's something interesting to talk about as a, as a question to us as authors. How many times have you looked at your work? You like, you know, you finished a short story or perhaps like a chapter of a book and you're just like, all right, I've introduced something that I don't know how to explain. Maybe I should either delete it or try and explain it now before I move on. Plenty of times. times. Explained. Uh, in real life, there are loads, loads of things we have to cope with which we can't explain and, and which we know we'll never find the answer to. Um... I mean, like, nobody will ever find, short of inventing tri time travel, no one will ever find out who who built, who, what individuals built Stonehenge and why. We can mm. only guess. Um, and we just got to live with that. If, if you're an intellectual who's curious about the past, then you just have to put up with that uh, agony of not knowing. And... It's the same with vampires, you know, why can't they cross running water? Well, sorry, you just got to you just got to accept it. And I think in fantasy, accepting is an absolute essential. I don't think you can have real answers to things in fantasy. Well, well you, you can, can have uh, you can have answers that are logical within the world. They might not be answers that will satisfy you from the physics or psycho uh, psychological or biological point of view. But they can uh, satisfy you by making some lick of uh, logical sense, right? Oh. So you could say, right, all, all the vampires hate running water because in domain where they existed before the time came forth and they were summoned upon the plane of existence of uh, humanity, there was never any running water. Right, they 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 lived in places where there was no water at all. They have no requ uh, requirement for water, so the idea of running water literally scares them. They do not. They are afraid of the concept. You know, it's a silly answer, but uh, what's it called? If you're gonna try and explain it, you're gonna have to follow some sort of logic. I think 
I think explaining the answer is less to the reader is less important than the author having some idea of why certain things are <clears throat> because that leads to better writing that makes sense like it doesn't it, it's, it's like it's like so so vampires can't cross wa uh, running water for instance and who knows what the actual reasons are but um uh uh, a writer who is writing about a story of uh, about a vampire story could write situations uh, if he sticks to his own internal route that makes sense logically in the story like the the, the story will flow in in a way that 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 is uh, consistent however it's um, as as it, 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 I, I think it really depends on the writer and the audience is targeting um, mm -hmm. Asylum, for instance, uh, A.E. Van Vogt. So, he certainly the, doesn't care. The, um, the, sorry, the real we, problem... We didn't hear any of that, um, Robert. Go on again. Sorry? Uh, could you start again? I didn't hear anything. Oh, sorry. Uh, the real problem is, is um, when it's not that failing to explain the rules, but not keeping to those rules consistently, which reminds me that in Dracula itself, I believe, uh, it's a while since I've read it, but I think that sometimes it seems that he can't move at all during the daytime, and sometimes it means, sometimes it seems to be saying that he can walk around like an ordinary human being, but he, he loses a lot of his power. He, he can walk around, not in direct sunlight, maybe, but, you know, in between the hours of sunrise and sunset, he has been seen walking around, uh, lifting heavy boxes and so on, because he's still a strong chap. Uh, I don't know. I could be wrong, but um, vampire uh, authors of vampire tales uh, seem to be um, seem to have trouble keeping to their own rules consistently. Certainly, Stephen King uh, in uh, Salem's Lot breaks oh. his own rules about about uh, you, you vampires can't come well, in unless you invite them because the, the the key vampire does barge in without being invited. See, yes, that's why I said it depends on the author and his target audience, right? You don't read uh, Stephen King for the plot. <laughs> he doesn't have a clue how to make a plot to save his own life. I mean, isn't the Dark Tower series him basically going back to a lot of his stories and trying to add more plot? Isn't that basically the the series? I mean, where he's like, "All right, I'm gonna connect everything, and this connection will make more plot," <laughs> which is what ev is missing from my novels. He doesn't. He, didn't. He, do he doesn't care about plot. It's like it, so in his uh, writing memoir on writing, he literally says. Well, not literally. Uh, uh, I would have to get his exact words. He, he uh, paraphrasing what he said was, for him the story is like, uh, it's like an archaeological dig. You you take a brush, you carefully uh, brush all the dirt away, and the story reveals itself, which is very revealing on his own. He doesn't plot. He doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't think about how um, how the characters get from point A to point B and then to point C, you know, it is revealed to him, meaning he mm. doesn't think about it. Mm. So yeah, he, he plot wise, you don't read Stephen King for plot. Seriously. No, no, I agree with you there. <laughs> but I don't think that needs be, that doesn't need to be a big defect. There are some rambling books which are quite quite good well some of his very good uh unlike you i think salem's lot is very good i don't really mind about the plots as long as the ideas are i didn't say i didn't say salem i i didn't say i didn't enjoy salem's lot oh didn't you sorry i thought you did yeah oh no what i said was uh stephen king doesn't write you don't read stephen king for plot his plots are shit no. but that's no i know you didn't, i don't i know you didn't say that this this week I'm talking about a while back that we oh, were talking about. Yeah. Well, yeah. hmm. Anyway, anyway. I'm who 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 is your favorite character in the Dark Trist? 
Robert. Uh, hmm. I'm just already thinking about it. Yeah. The chap, what's his name? Uh, Sergio? Something, something being with D. Damius. Uh, Damius. Yes. Uh, he's quite effective, but then again, so is Maria, so it's hard to choose between them. I really like the the fact that you have to that she has to say his name before he appears. I really like that. That was really cool. Um, but what about you? Actually, who's your favorite character? Uh, Annalise. She's the only normal character. <laughs> she's the only person. You know? <laughs> she's the only yes. She's the only person in that story. <laughs> I my favorite is Lizette. Lizette is so creepy. <laughs> She's so good at being creepy. Uh, I think uh, I read uh, uh, the the author, um, um, Miss Heyday, did a fantastic work on Lizette. I think Lizette is pinnacle uh, horror. You know, she's just this <laughs> weird person who sends subliminal messages towards our protagonist. And she, every time she's on screen, it's a joy to watch what she's going to do. I really enjoyed Lizette. I mean, quite honestly, all of the characters are really well written, except maybe for Sergio. But Sergio is more like, it's just a lack of time to develop the guy, I think. Yeah, he's yeah. just a backdrop character. Great characterization all around. I mean, you know, honestly, I would uh, I would recommend people read Dark Trist even if you don't like Ravenloft. I mean, look at Robert; he didn't die, and he read it. You know? <laughs> he yeah. didn't get drawn yeah. into into Barovia for sure. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> but um, but yeah, um, do we have anything else we'd like to say? Or should we move on to the scores? Mm, no. I mean. Uh, if if any of our listeners are the kind of people who liked interview with the vampire or the mummy, uh, also written by Anne Rice, then uh, Duchess is a would be a story for you, I think. Mm. Or give it a shot. Yeah. Okay, let's go for score, man. All right. Well, I'll give this a solid eight, uh, eight bats out of ten. <laughs> eight bats out of ten. <laughs> and you, Robert? I'll give it a seven. Uh, it's it's seven very, bats uh, out of ten, or just seven? Seven. seven. Okay. <laughs> it's, very, it's very well written, um, <laughs> but I. I have my doubts about uh, the presentation of the basic idea. I'm not sure. It could just be my defects as a reader. But anyway, a seven is not a bad score after all. No, no. But uh, I'm curious. What do you mean by the presentation of the idea? <sighs> I mean that I'm not sure what the heck it means. Um, mm. But I don't know how much that is my fault. So I'm hedging my bets a bit with giving it a seven. It could mm. deserve more. I don't. I don't think it deserves less. It could deserve more. I don't know. Hmm. Cool. I'm just a bit stingy with my scores. Stingy. Yeah. Yeah. That's your scores, you know. Robert. As yeah, as wow, well. I never. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, actually, how many bats out of ten do you? Yeah. Do you uh, give same as you, man. Eight bats out of ten. Yeah. Eight bats out of ten. Okay. Eight Halloween yeah. cookies it deserves out it. of ten. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's actually a really good story. I enjoyed reading it. Yeah, it's very pleasant to read, <laughs> which is strange <laughs> to say. Which is strange to say because it's like it's quite horrible. But the prose oh, is well quite, done. Okay. the characters are okay, fun. Okay, that's actually that's actually a good point. Um, I nearly forget about it. So the last thing I will say with this story is, what Mariel did is actually pretty dark. It is mm. pretty yeah, she, dark. Yeah, she stole a child, man. She stole, didn't. Stole she didn't just life. stole a child. You know, she she stole a child of the only person who showed her any degree of warmth and friendship. Mm, it is that's true. It is a betrayal of um of uh 
it is a act of selfishness of a kind mm. that is not that is is quite reprehensible you mm. know and she she must have known that there was something shady about the deal it wasn't just a yeah. matter of getting a drop of blood she yeah must and, have... and how it's like regardless of how she was treated by the rest of her caravan Annalise at least treated her pretty well uh comparatively and the fact that she didn't even really think twice it's like wow that is she is a serious character you know of her in her own right mm. yeah and yeah. and you uh, know you know the thing is she didn't she she felt no remorse at all about her actions even when she saw the uh the 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 shriveled the uh, black shriveled mess that used to be Annalisa's uh, baby son you know i don't i, I don't mm. recall she showed any remorse mm. yeah i mean honestly if i became a uh a deathless vampire i also would feel no remorse probably i'd be like yeah well <laughs> that was the prize <laughs> i mean i don't know man but yeah so well don't you feel like nothing don't don't you feel like nothing when you're a vampire i thought that's the whole no i I think think, well okay i just totally disagree with you that we're dragging on the show but uh i think vampires (laughs) out of all of the undead monsters in popular culture are unique in the regard that they are very they're filled with passion well, Wait. Of, a sort, of a sort. I think I think Dracula himself must have got awfully bored in his castle because that's the only reason he could have had for for trying to move to England. Uh, <laughs> there was no no logical reason why he should abandon his uh, his castle and his uh, submissive um, his submissive and cowed lot of peasants. Yes, what was his uh, reason for moving to England? I don't know. Maybe he liked well, exactly. the weather. What you're saying the no reason is given is to, I think I think he was just bored. That's you it's know what, true. and that's great motivation. Um, in the in the book uh, Master and Margarita, one of my favorite books of all time, uh, the devil comes to Moscow because he's bored. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so fun. It's just so fun. The, the entire book is so fun. Yeah, you really uh, get get a kick out of uh, everything that uh, the devil gets to do in Moscow. It's really fun. Anyway, well, yeah. uh, I I am dragging on the show. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. So hit like and subscribe if uh, you guys uh, enjoy. Uh, if our listeners enjoyed this uh, episode, help us grow the channel and maybe we can examine other short stories or stories even. And if you have any suggestions, any like uh, really nice stories that you, you have read and want to share with us, please feel free to put it in the comment section below. And with that, happy Halloween. Ooh.